Good evening, everyone. This is your main host, Ruud Baric. And today I have my reappearing guest joining me again, Jeffrey Nukis. Jeff, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Rudolf. Great to hear. And how is it with the corona status in California? Um, it's the same. We're in lockdown and uh, it's continuing and there's no end in sight. I've asked some people connected to the state when it's going to end. Nobody knows. Uh, it's a similar because uh, what I heard now when I saw the statistics is that the United States has been very uh, affected by the virus. Um, yeah, say? the economy, the economy is very heavily affected. In fact, uh, the, there's a projected, the food uh, chain has been affected. Uh, they're they're uh, anticipating uh, problems with the supply of meat. And oh. because the meat, uh, the people who are, uh, you know, process the meat, the meat plants have become infected with coronavirus. And oh. they were closing down meat plants. And so the government, I think uh, John Tyson of Tyson Foods, publicly said, now the food chain is affected and um, the National Guard is stepping in. The, uh, Trump is intervening to make sure that the meat plants don't all close because it would be catastrophic if the supply of meat was cut off oh. to the country because that's a main source of protein for most people. Oh, absolutely. I can really understand that. Yes. Yeah. No, but here we have, I mean, now it has it has spread in, in Sweden too. So then people are, are, are worried here as well. So, so we, we just have to see what will happen. But the, the economy has been affected too. Pretty much it has sent shockwaves all over the world and especially hitting you know, United States and Europe too. So I really hope that, um, that this really will come to an end and that, that we will emerge victorious from this. Yes, um, I'm hoping so too. I'm hoping that the economies can, can get started again. But again, we don't uh, know when this thing's going to go away. I, I, you know, about the virus, I should mention, I got some intelligence uh, from sources uh, there is a person out of China who had connection with people in the government who is uh, like a defector who is saying that um, as of now, about 5 million people uh, in China have died. Um, That's and, pretty. Yeah. It it is, is a, lo a, lot of mo a lot of people. And they have, uh, apparently there's a, some kind of documented proof that one of the the uh, funeral homes in uh, Wuhan, and I think there's about there's about ten, if you judge their size, uh, about approximately ten like this. Um, that um, in a two week period, they burned uh, forty five thousand bodies. Yes. So if you if you multiply that in Wuhan by the number of, of funeral homes of approximate size or average them. You could get close to half a million people dying in a in a in a two week period in Wuhan. Sure, and uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't be surprised, you know, if if that would be the case. So, yeah, uh, it's pretty shocking if these yeah, effects absolutely. are it's true. Horrible. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, it is. But we're gonna we we're gonna cover. I think we we there's so much you know news coverage on Corona so on, and so on. So I've been thinking. For today's topic, with that I want to uh, let's say introduce let's say let's say a different narrative about the fall of the uh, socialist republic of Yugoslavia, and uh, because lately I saw a video by an old writer who posted a video that was entitled The Killing of Yugoslavia. And like the title implies that it was basically a Western intention through the policy of divide and conquer to make you to 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 dissolve Yugoslavia and so on in order for the Western powers to simply, you know, destroy a powerful enemy and also to integrate Yugoslavia in the economic system of liberal capitalism. So, and, and, and in the video that I, I saw, 
it was a very pro-Russian, pro-Serbian narrative in the sense that, oh, the Serbs were the victims and the Western powers, they were the aggressors who just wanted to, you know, make Yugoslavia crumble. So I've been thinking for, for this topic, so we discussed a little bit about uh, Yugoslavia and also that we try to give as much as we can. Now, I am a Croat patriot 100%, so of course I cannot be all that 100% objective in that sense, but uh, I want to bring in many insights and to view it from di from a different vantage point. What would you say about this as a discussion, Jeff? It sounds fascinating. Yes. So, uh, because I've been thinking, you know, we saw like in if we look a little bit like you and I, we had the show, and this is very important to especially for the younger generation and those that are more inclined toward the, this radical right or dissident right or whatever we want to call it. We have noticed this, that we had the same pattern, for instance, when it came to the Ukraine crisis, that mm -hmm. the old writers, not all of them, but many of them were pro-Moscow in this sense. They took immediately the Kremlin side against the U Ukrainian uh, nationalists. And and I will never remember when Yugoslavia actually fell and also the discussion afterwards. In the beginning, it was usually a left wing narrative blaming everything on the West and making, let's say, Serbs as the victim of this horrible crisis and the civil war that took place in its aftermath. Now, and, and what I have noticed is that the right winger they have taken on this path. They have continued with the Serbian victimology. That is, the Serbs are the victims, and it was all bad intention from the West to bring down this socialist success. And there are many anomalies with this um, analysis, and I want to bring this forward. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, and maybe we could start uh, with a, a brief history, and you could fill in for me, of uh, how Yugoslavia, of course, it didn't become a country until after World War I. Um, uh, you could sort of fill in the blanks. We, we could maybe start with the fact that uh, the, the Ottoman Turks overran the Balkans in the wars that it fought, the Ottoman Wars, and that then you had the, the Holy Roman Empire, you had the, um, the, the Austrian Empire, uh, fighting the Turks, and then progressively the, the Turks were driven back, and so you have the emergence of the nations out of out of this this conflict of empires, right? Well, absolutely. Well, let's let's say uh, I think it's a good starting point, and I think we it's it's very good to start with history. Now, what Serbs celebrate is the battle in Kosovo Polia. It was a battle in 1389 when the, the advancing forces of the Ottoman Empire, before they took over the Byzantine Empire, they managed to, they had this battle in Kosovo where the Serbs put on a lot of resistance and afterwards they lost this battle in 1389 and then the Serbia and Bosnia and Macedonia fell under the Ottoman Empire for almost 500 years. And in Croatia, on the other hand, was not, uh, they did not reach to Poland, they did not reach to Croatia and so on. So the Croats, they simply managed to avoid being subjected to the Ottoman rule, that is. And if we look at, uh, if we study the timeline, to break it down a little bit, now Yugoslavia, you had the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, which existed, let's say, from 1918 and 19, let's say, 29 or so. And it was the kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenians. And then afterwards, when the, when the Second World War erupted, Yugoslavia was, the, the kingdom of Yugoslavia was shattered to pieces, and you also had the Croats, well, they got their independent state, because they installed, let's say, a fascist regime, headed by uh, Ante Pavelic, 
and he had both good ties, both with, for instance, Germany and with Italy too. So that's just to put it a little bit uh, uh, to, 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 to not go too much into history. What would you like to ask me about this? Yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the tragic outcome of the, um, uh, the battles in, in Yugoslavia in which Tito, a communist who was initially backed by the Russians and also the British, managed to get control of the country. And then the persecution of uh, various people like the Croats occurred then. Maybe you could talk about uh, Tito's uh, coming to power. Mm -hmm. Well, that's very good because here you have it. And, and this is very important to, to, to view it from this point. Like when we say when, when Germany crippled, let's say, the Serbian army, it was like a devastating blow immediately. Uh, the Croat, they saw their opportunities to get their independent state. And they also had, let's say, so, so it started a resistance, basically. You had Serbian nationalists that were very, let's say, connected to, to the Serbian kingdom. And they are called the Chetniks. So they are basically Serbian royalists, um, very loyal to the Serbian king. And then you had the fraction, you had a Croats, the fascist re regime, the Ustasha, what it's called, mm -hmm. and and the Bosnians. What happened was they, the, the Bosnian Muslims, at that point on, they were very connected, let's say, to the Croat Ustasha regime. So what happened was that you had a civil war during the Second World War, and you had, for instance, so you had on the one hand, you had those Serbian royalists. They wanted to create a greater Serbia. They wanted to take over territories from Croatia, from Eastern Croatia, from Vojvodina, from Bosnia and so on, and create a great Serbian empire. The Croats, on the other hand, they're accused of wanting to create a greater Croatia, consisting of, like, like we mentioned, the Dalmatia and also parts of Bosnia, the northeastern Bosnia, where you have a Croat, let's say, population living there today. So they, so they, and then you had also, the, let's say, the Bolsheviks, backed up and they will call the the partisans Tito's partisan because it started like uh, like a partisan war you know and they were backed by Moscow like you said and their intention was to create a socialist federalist republic and it was let's say proclaimed in 1943 in Bosnia uh, uh, Tito's let's say, Federatia, uh, uh, sorry, y y Yugoslav Republic, but it was naturally not acknowledged. But so, so you had these forces fighting each other, and it was a very bloody civil war d during the Second World War too. what many people, they... So, and this, if we follow a little bit, like the Croats, they installed a c concentration camp labeled Yasenovac, and so, and in this official narrative, many Jews, they were prosecuted, they were by the Croats, uh, and also you had the problem with Serbs and, and, and also with, um, let's say, um, well, other minorities and so on, gypsies. And so, so you had, so the, the Croats, they were very loyal to, to Germany, and so on, and um, but so, so you so you had this war, and then when the Croats they lost the war, when Germany lost the war, all of a sudden in 1945 uh, they they gave up uh, the Croat forces, and they wanted to somehow negotiate with uh, with the Brits to to not be you know directed to Tito's partisans and so on. But in in Blyburg, you have this infamous massacre that took place and uh, the Brits simply gave uh, handed the Croats over to 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 Tito's partisans and then you had uh, a massive genocide committed against the Croat people at that time so you have this narrative let's say so so you had a very bloody war and torn country and then they had to go through a path of reconciliation 
the Croats, they were forcefully integrated into this republic created by Tito, the Yugoslav Federal, Federal Republic. So, I mean, if you have all those atrocities being committed and now somehow you want to, let's say, like Tito, he used to call it unity and brotherhood. He wanted to create a path where we all get along and we all create, a, uh, it's, we will move on to a new chapter in the history. So, so, so there it started. Please go ahead. Um, if you want. Yeah, I, I should make a comment about the Chetniks is that uh, one might think that the as the Soviets and Stalin were supporting Tito, that the British might be supporters of the Chetniks, right? Because but no agents of influence in uh, Churchill's government persuaded Churchill. And this is, by the way, it's an exact duplicate of what happened with Chiang Kai-shek and Mao in China. You had a group of, of, of academics and agents of influence who repeatedly were telling Churchill and the British generals that the Chet Chetniks weren't really fighting the Nazis, that they were really secretly collaborating with them, and that, the, that Tito was the one to support, so that the British were, were persuaded to actually help the communist side more than they would help the Chetnik side. And the same thing with Chiang Kai-shek and, and Mao in China. You had this enormous communist influence operation on the American government saying Chiang Kai-shek won't fight the Japanese. Uh, he's really secretly collaborating with them. And Mao Zedong is the one that's, that's actually fighting the Japanese. And, and of course, in reality, the, the communists were, were secretly collaborating mm -hmm. with the Japanese on many levels. Uh, to get it, but because there was a at the same time there was world war Jeff. going on. There was a civil war between the communists and the nationalists in China, just like in Yugoslavia. So there was a similar game going on in Western capitals over this issue. And the tragedy is in both in Yugoslavia and China, the communists won because of the communist influence yeah. in the West, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. And of course, yes, Croatia had no chance. In that in that kind of environment, because nobody in no. the West was going to stick up for Croatia at that point. Uh, exactly, but usually when you when you hear this that with the Chetniks, it's it's very special because you often hear, in let's say uh, in the Serbian narrative, they try to describe them as heroes. They went against the German occupiers and so on. But the fact of the matter is that Germany used both the Chetniks and the Ustasha Croats to, to just advance their positions as best they possibly could, because naturally the Germans saw also an anti-communist, let's say, thread within the, the, the Chetnik movement too. So naturally they used that too to advance their interests. Yeah, put there's, it. A, there's a three-way, it's sort of like a three-way strategy game. Mm -hmm. where you have the German interest, you have the Chetniks, and you have the Titoists. And, of course, uh, who fights who and who gets on top? It, there's only going to be one winner. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be either the Germans, the Chetniks, or the Titoists. There isn't going to be any way that two of them or all three of them can win because it's a, it's a, it's a battle where only one can come out at the end. Sure. But and also what is very important to bear in mind when, for instance, like uh, after when the when the war ended, uh, you, the Yugoslav authorities, they wanted to create, let's say they wanted to move to a new path in history. So they wanted to create this unity and brotherhood conception. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the Serbs were very you know, they also utilize this victimology of what happened to them in Yasenovac, for instance, that they were, they were persecuted together with with um, with the Jewish people and that they actually were subjected to, to genocide from the Croat authorities. So they always push this on the people to remember, look what the Ustasha and what the German collaborators did to, to, to Serbs. So it was very awkward for Croats because, OK, those Croats that were loyal to Tito, that that were, let's say, uh, let's say, that were good, you know, let's say, faithful communists and so on, like Franjo Tudjman, who became the first Croat president in modern time, he was one of the youngest generals in Yugoslavia, and he was actually 
uh, loyal partisan to Tito. He was 19 years old when the Second World when, when the Second World War went on. Uh, so, so this is very interesting too. But mm -hmm. what ha but ha what happened was that there was a path of reconciliation and to move forward. However, many Croats they were very upset about this massacre that happened in Austria in Bleiburg that caused the death. Now there are different figures. How many people died? I believe more than over over 100,000 people, and this is the official figures. I believe that even more soldiers that gave up and their wives and their children and so on, all of them were massacred and it was on on orders of Tito. So 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 many Croats find that hmm, it was very difficult to move on to a path of unity and brotherhood when this genocide occurred. So, but it doesn't even stop there because yeah, like yeah, when you hear all those, talk, please go ahead if you want to ask me so I don't talk too much. Oh, yes. um, uh, well, it's very interesting. The, the, the 100,000, uh, you know, estimated genocide of Croatians. I wanted to make a comment about the, the brotherhood idea, which uh, is, is in communism. And we see it on the left that all men are brothers. And it's very interesting how much killing usually is involved in making men brothers. <laughs> and um, it's also kind of, it's unrealistic for a number of reasons because, you know, people talk about identity, talk against identity politics, but really uh, uh, identity is part of who we are, where we came from. We all speak a language. We have a religious background. We have, we have a ch shared, certain shared history, things that go on. And uh, the idea of making one people, uh, making a nation out of different people. I mean, um, uh, it's, you know, the, the idea of Yugoslavia, maybe you could comment on this, that this, this unity of these peoples, I mean, ethnically in terms of language, uh, I mean, uh, uh, racially and in terms of language, they're the same people. But uh, let's talk about the actual differences between these groups in Yugoslavia. Mm. Okay, well, let's start, for instance, with Croats and Serbs. Like, like you hear, the, oh, they're all their own linguistic differences and so on. But it's not the entire truth. I mean, if you look at, you know, let's say, Croats and Serbs, they were divided along the east and western parts of Rome. For instance, their Serbs, they were more, they, they, they landed on the eastern side and the Croats landed on the western side. So naturally they had different kind of, his, they went through different kind of historical, let's say, processes. So, and the, not so on, the Serbs were Eastern Orthodox and the Croats were Roman Catholics. That's, if you look at in religious terms, you have the Croats, we are, uh, let's say, Roman Catholics and the Serbs are Eastern Orthodox, yes. So that's the one division. And if we look at linguistically speaking, they use the Cyrillic alphabet Serbs, whereas the Croats use the Latin alphabet. So you have a different in, in terms of writing. Speaking wise, oh, it's a, sim it's a similar language. I can perfectly well understand a Serbian and a Serb can understand me perfectly well as well. And if you look at the ethnic component now, the Serbs were more than five, almost 500 years under Ottoman Empire, so surely they must have had some kind of mixture in that sense that have, uh, let's say, affected their ethnicity, whereas we Croats were not under Ottoman rule, rather we were, let's say, under Hungarian rule. So there you have the difference too. Yeah, now that's very fascinating, the psychological difference, because... I, I think there has to be, if you're under the Turks for hundreds of years, there has to be a psychological effect and a cultural effect of that. Well, absolutely. And also, um, well, I, yes, absolutely. And um, so, so there you have the difference between these peoples. And then if you look at the Yugoslavia, that were integrated into the Socialist uh, Federation, you had like Croatia, Serbia. Serbia were, was the largest country, no doubt. And then secondly was Croatia. And then you had Macedonia. And then you have Bosnia uh, at that, uh, at, like nowadays Bosnia, Herzegovina, Bosnia. And then you had Macedonia. And then also you had like Vojvodina, which is a part of, uh, uh, yeah, 
which is part of Serbia now when they have a Hungarian uh, population living there. Oh, so there's the Hungarians and Slovenia yeah. too. And, Slo and Slovenians too, sorry, yeah. absolutely, yes. Yeah. And the Slovenians, they were like more, let's say, drawn, let's say they, they were Slavic people mixed with, uh, mit, with, with, with Austrians, you might say, but the Slovenians, they never had uh, a sovereign state in the past. Mm -hmm. They were they, the closest one was the in 1918 that I say the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, where you have the three kingdoms of Croatia, Serbia, and uh, Slovenia. Well, uh, well, here's a here's a question: Was there yeah. actually a king of each of these groups, or was it just one king of all of them? Yeah, it was one king of all of them. Yeah, and that was the king that was overthrown in 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 1941. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And and I just just out of curiosity, uh, because I've heard both versions, I've heard the version that the uh, British were behind the overthrow, were involved in supporting it, and I've heard that the that Solon was behind it as well. Do you have any insight into this? About the you, I mean the kingdom of Yugoslavia, how it about breaks the down. coup that yeah about the the the, the coup that I mean I mean the the kingdom of uh, the kingdom was going to side with Germany before this coup, right? Um, yeah, but also Germany they bombed Yugoslavia. Right, I know they bombed it because there was a change in the government mm. in Yugoslavia. Right? Yeah. Yes, and, yes, and yes. So, so basically, Yugoslavia was going to join the Axis. At least it was thought that they were well, they were leaning, tilting toward the Axis, um, uh, sort of in the same way that uh, that that well, Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria ultimately became allied to Germany during the war. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I think that. The way we understand it is that mm -hmm. the Serbs, they always have maintained very good ties with Great Britain. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I mean, I don't have any information that they right. were actually, you know, preparing. Well, there was an agreement between uh, Yugoslavia and Germany before that coup that made the Germans feel at least secure that the Yugoslavs were not going to join the Allies. Mm hmm and that when the coup occurred, then then they were Yugoslavia was going to join the Allies, and the Germans intervened. That's when when the 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 invasion of Yugoslavia occurred, and that was in uh, April 1941. I'm yes. I'm remembering right. It, no, yeah, it was. Yes, it was in April exactly. Yeah, um, but yeah, I and never, I think I, that, I read, it should have happened earlier. Yeah, but I think I, yeah, so yeah. I, I've read different details, and I've always been curious. It's always been foggy, and all the, you know, it's it's like these Western histories don't really focus very effectively on what happened in I Yugoslavia yeah, exactly. Because the way the way we the way the way I see it is that, for instance, the Serbian lead, the Serbian Chetnik leader Draža Mihailović, like for instance, when Germany let's say, intervened immediately, they started a resisting in the very beginning against the German forces, you know, because Croats, they were immediately able to, to, to receive their, their sovereign state, which they were, you know, refused to, to achieve. So that's the way, the, the way I see it. So I, I don't know if the kingdom of Yugoslavia actually was an ally or because if you look at also the battles in Stalingrad and so on, Ian, I have not seen any that the Serbian Chetniks joined in, in fighting the Soviets. Oh, no, no, there and, were no, the, the Chetniks no. did not join the German army. No, and absolutely no, not, not, the, not, no. not even, not even volunteers fighting as one, but Croats. No. They were in it from the very beginning, you know. Well, I've, uh, I've you know, I've read, uh, but, but of course, I've read accounts that the Chetniks, you know, in a in were were actually not working with the Nazis. That they were trying to build up their forces to work with the British, of course. But the British ended up rejecting them. Um, but sure. uh, but this is it's this very, is a it's very fuzzy. Yeah, it's yeah, very fuzzy, it fuzzy from that era. Because um, you had like what happened before we go into the mod the breakup of the modern Yugoslavia, you had like 
a war, like Hobbes would say, a war against the every uh, all. You know, they, they were fighting this fraction, this fraction were fighting this, and so on. So you, it it becomes it's not making any sense. You know who's right, fighting? Yeah, who is it? yeah. When yeah, the central government breaks down. Sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is a very you know the 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 history of this period is. Uh, when you read, uh, for example, Schellenberg's memoirs, Schellenberg was tracking Yugoslav uh, spies in Berlin. Uh, the Yugoslavs were, had successfully did, uh, penetrated some uh, German um, institutions. They had a spy ring in Berlin. And Schellenberg, before he became the head of uh, foreign intelligence, was in German uh, SS counterintelligence. And he writes in his memoirs about his maneuvering against the Serbians, that the Serbians had these um, very effective secret service, uh, or I should say the Yugoslavs, uh, and that they were not friendly, that the secret service was not friendly to Germany. Uh, but then outwardly, they'd made it, of course, if you're Yugoslavia in 1939, you don't want to be outwardly unfriendly to Germany because that could invite invasion. But the way I understand it, yes, if we look at the, the geopolitics from that, let's say uh, when when Yugoslavia installed, let's say, the the dictatorship under King Alexander, it, it there were also good ties with Great Britain and France to 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 let's say to go against the expansionist policy of Italy. Uh, Mm -hmm. because we saw that Italy took, took much more territories from the 1920s and, and onwards and so on. Yes, and, and in, wasn't it in 1939 that Italy uh, basically annexed Albania? Yes, they annexed Albania, they annexed, uh, not only, but they annexed also part of, uh, part of Slovenia now, uh, it's called Istria, which belongs to current which belongs to Croatia and so on, yes. Yeah, so it took many yeah. territories. So you had an Italian Italian influence in that region too. And yeah, also in a, Dal Dalmatia, yes. Yeah, there was an Italian imperialism. And of course, uh, during the occupation, when Croatia was set up, uh, and during the occupation of, of Serbia and Bosnia, um, I think because the, the terrain, and I've never been to the country is 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 hilly and and there's there's uh, yes. there's changes in elevation quite a few changes in elevation and so it, it really is kind of ideal for partisan warfare and it tied down something like twenty Axis divisions quite a few Italian and German divisions were tied down because of the nature of the country and the the, the willingness yes. to resist of the Bosnians and the and the Serbians yeah so they delegated. The Germans, they simply found it a possibility to get delegate power to, to let's say, a, a loyal regime like Croatia. So Croatia actually did, and it's a dark chapter in our history. And so they installed this Yasenovac camp, like nice. it's in, in, in infamous. And uh, and of course, you know, they they shipped many Jews over and so on, and and many Serbs they died and so on, but. The death toll of how many people died in the Yasenovac camp has been very, I don't want to go too much into this, but it has been very exaggerated by, by Serbians, historians and so on, because this is the, the interesting stuff what I want to talk about is that you also wanted to vilify the Croats, those Croats that were actually, let's say, pro-German. And so anyone who, who, who uttered, let's say, when Yugoslavia was conceived as a sovereign state, and and afterwards, anyone who uttered any kind of pro, sent, let's say, nationalist sentiments that went against went against this official narrative of un, unity and brotherhood, well, they were actually labeled immediately Ustasha, you know, mm -hmm. and um, but yeah, but it's, it's is, the tragedy yeah, it's, of a it's a tragedy of a small country uh, that's allied with Germany, the losing side in a war. And a side that, of course, committed so many atrocities during the war. Uh, by the way, all sides committed to atrocities in the war. But the German atrocities were particularly heinous, especially when you get to how they were exposed later in the war. But the, 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 the tragedy of a people who, you know, everybody's not guilty of what some government does. 
uh, every, you know, most of the people are just innocent people living their lives, but they get caught up because you get a job in, in, in some government agency or your relative is in the army uh, fighting on the Eastern front. And then you end up getting your whole family ends up getting massacred. That's the tragedy of war. Yes, and and also what what needs to be taken into consideration. Consideration. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, let's say, I'm not uh, if, uh, being apologetic or anything for for the for what happened in the past. But if you look at this, took this happened during war time, the atrocities, mm -hmm. and yeah. like Jeff said, okay, the Croats they committed atrocity, but so did the Serbian Chetniks too, and definitely Tito's partisan, how they massacred people in Blyburg. Now, the interesting part is that Blyburg was totally, it was a black box, it was totally sealed. You never discussed anything about what happened in Blyburg, and also you did not discuss, even though Draža Mihailović was, uh, was executed in 1948 in Beograd, even though, because the Serbs, they were, let's say, they were running the upper echelons of the Yugoslavian, Yugoslavian Communist Party too. So somehow you did not, you did not, uh, let's say, vilify the Serbian people to that extent as they vilify the Croats. Right. So, there was so this, it, yeah, that's a good point because there was this thing from the end of World War One, where they vilified the Germans as a people for the war. And this kind of got carried over to other groups at, at the end of World War uh, Two, also. Yes, and this is w w the point that I will make now is that, for instance, so so w when when the war was over, you, you you they wanted to create something new. They wanted to create a Yugoslavian identity. Now, what is very interesting is that uh, the Serbs they. They Slavically, they immediately embraced this Yugoslavian identity. And so did the Bosnians at that time, because they were like very torn in the sense, what kind of identity should they embrace? Because they were Muslims, but they were also European Muslims. So naturally they took on this Yugoslav identity. But one group that resisted, especially the diaspora that lived abroad, was the Croat diaspora, which I belong to. Now, and, and we were always, let's say, proud of being Croats and we resisted this Yugoslavian identity. We did not want to be part of it. Now, mm -hmm. those Croat people that lived in exile, that lived in Germany, in Sweden, where I currently live in Sweden and so on, and in Canada and also in America, you know, what they were they were like being very patriotic and they wanted to go against Yugoslavia. They wanted to, why cannot Yugoslavia you know, discuss about the atrocity that happened in Blyburg and so on. So they started to forming a resistance. But the Yugoslav authorities under the leadership of Tito, they sent agents to just go and commit extrajudicial killings, wiping out Croat dissidents. So it was a very strange way of going to a path of reconciliation, I would say. Yes. That's, a, in other words, death squad and going abroad and killing people. Exactly. Um, yeah. Exactly. And, and, like and by and the I'm way, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Khrushchev did a similar thing by sending assassins to kill Ukrainian uh, nationalists that were living in Germany, for example. Um, yeah, uh, so you so see the parallel, uh, the parallel again. Uh, so, so, yeah, so you see the parallel again. But, but the point what I want to, what is very interesting here for, for people to understand is that Usually, like, um, uh, it's, it's very interesting that, of course, they mentioned that, oh, the Tito's partisans, they were, oh, we're different, you know, we, 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 we wanted to curtail both the Chetniks and both the Ustasha, Croats, and so on. But it's very interesting. You had many Serbs living in exile, let's say, in Germany, too, and so on. You had Macedonians living in exile, and so on. But... The, t the Titoists, they never sent out the agent to wipe them out. Maybe it could have happened. I have not heard of it. But always it was to go against the Croats full scale abroad. So so we have very bad memory of this. Now, b before we go into the internal characteristics of, of communist Yugoslavia, if we look at, for instance, uh, that many, let's say, Old writers, they, they seem to think that Yugoslavia was some kind of a socialist paradise. 
Now, I'm willing to uh, agree. Uh, Sorry. Oh, but by yeah. the way, many people on the left believe that too. Uh, famously, Peter Falk, uh, who played Columbo in the Columbo series, yes. he went to Yugoslavia. He was a big fan of Tito, and he thought it was a socialist paradise. Not only that, you had Sofia Loren visiting Tito. He was like a rock star, Tito, like a royal. You know, he had many friends. I think I'm not sure if it's Kirk Douglas, many of them, you know, so he visited Yugoslavia and so so. So he was quite well known. Now I'm going to break down Tito very easy. He was excellent when he did his external relations abroad. Let's say when he when he started this non-aligned movement in 1948, when he wanted to break away from the Warsaw Pact and he wanted to create some kind of third position in world affairs. So he was a lot in India. He had ties with many African countries and so on. And he was very popular and he had excellent ties with Israel too. David Ben-Gurion has, has praised Tito on several occasions, you know. So, so Tito had very good, uh, let's say, reputation abroad, but he remained, let's say, a hated figure among, among Croats. And also when you had those, this turmoil beginning, you, you see the ethnic uh, competition between these peoples. They did not get along. It was a forced, let's say, a project forced upon people to embrace this identity that no one actually really believed in. Now, uh, b before we start to, 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 to dissect the downfall of Yugoslavia, is that usually you hear that the Western powers, like I said initially, they had an intention to, br to, to make Yugoslavia disintegrate, that because Yugoslavia posed as a dangerous, strong country that went a third position and and somehow it proved to be a socialist success. Now, if, if Yugoslavia was a socialist success, how is it possible that so many Croats, Serbs and people from when I think it was in 1964 when Tito, he, he, he gave his people an option. You can either stay or go and work abroad in Germany and Canada, Australia and so on. And a tons of people, they just left, you know. Yeah, so I mean, it, obviously they were voting with their feet. I mean, how, you know, I've talked to uh, uh, people from your country uh, about the economy and you hear different, if they were attached to the Communist Party, they were praising it. But if they weren't part of the party, they didn't think much of the economy, um, that it, there wasn't a lot of opportunity. You couldn't make, you know, if, if people were poor um, and, and of course the Yugo car, right? This famous car yes. that people, the people I knew socialists who wanted to buy the car, but it would always break down all the time. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, to be, I'm going to be honest, in comparison to, to, let's say, DDR, in comparison to Albania, Bulgaria, uh, let's say even Soviet and so on, of course it posed, it was an advanced country in comparison to, 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 to those countries that I mentioned. But like you said, Jeff, like we had this, like this Sir Montenegrin novelist by the name of Milovan Gias, who was a top tier within this communist party. He was supposed to succeed Tito, you know, but but he went against Tito and ended up in prison. He is a well-known, uh, let's say, uh, writer by the name of Milo Vangelis, and he wrote this oh, book, yes. the Nomen. He wrote this book, the Nomenclatura, and uh, and he described it just like you. Like if the, there are very limited options to 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 achieve, let's say, certain certain prestigious jobs and so on, so you had to be affiliated with the Communist Party. That was one way of looking at it. Now, what I want to say to all those, let's say, who praise this, oh, it was a socialist success. Well, naturally, because what Tito did, he, he was quite smart. He, he, he started to liberalize, liberalize the country in economic sense. And in 1948, Washington saw an opportunity to, to, to create more division within the Eastern Bloc. So that's why... Yugoslavia, they received many credit credit loans and so on, so they can build up their economy. And after when Stalin died, Yugoslavia was very good at balancing both the East, East and the West to position itself and to build up its military capability. That's very interesting, too. Yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, and there's, uh, you know, obviously Tito remained 
a communist. He helped communist causes in the third world. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, um, but he did. Oh, yes. Um, and, of course, um, uh, it's uh, some of the defectors would claim, I think i got to remember, uh, Jan Shana, the claim was that the that if it came down to World War III, Tito was going to be on the side of the Soviet Union. Um, but then the West thought that he might be on their side. So it's hard to say what Tito would have it's, done if I there just, had been a war. I actually yeah. have, uh, I actually have, um, have uh, heard from, from my past relatives very long time ago that they actually heard a speech when Tito said, we, were go we will do everything we can to stop the Russian influence in in our country and so on. So in 1948 and onwards and so on, I, I really believe that it, that he did have genuine, let's say, interest to to curtail Russian dominance in the region, especially when Stalin was in life. You know, I really do mm -hmm. so. But it might have ch changed afterwards during Khrushchev era when they started to normalize the conditions between the countries. Yeah. But what I want to say, yeah, but what I want to say is also that. In, in many senses, like I said in the beginning of this, that you never had, let's say, the, the powers within the Yugoslavia, between those sovereign republics, they were never actually, let's say, symmetrical. You had, like it is in many communist countries, you have a concentration to the capital, let's say to Beograd, to Belgrade, and the outskirts and so on, and the top tier officers, military policemen, were all of Serbian descent, like, for instance, a uh, head of UDBA, which is equivalent to uh, the, the Yugoslav KGB, uh, was a, a man by the name of Aleksandar Rankovic. And this man was a butcher. He was really anti-Croat and he was very anti-Albanian. You know, he was like policing in the Kosovo region, committing heinous atrocities against the Albanian people. And this guy was very near. He was quite close to Tito Alexander Rankovic. And, and this is just one example that the accumulation of wealth in regards to the economy and the accumulation of power in military capability, were, everything was connected, let's say, centralized into Serb hands. And many people don't know that. And the Serbs, they went quite along with it. They said, you know, of course, we are Yugoslavians, we're proud and so on. But naturally, they were the ones who were in power. And naturally, they have some obedient Croats, Bosniaks and so on. But overall, it was like a great Serbian, let's say, um, not maybe, it was like a somehow great Serbia in communist, let's say, disguise, I would say, something like that. Not maybe that they were able to project fully. They had to adapt themselves to the communist discourse and so on. So they could not go all out in their nationalism. But nevertheless, the Serbs were very, very invested in this Yugoslavian project because during the 80s and 90s even, you seldomly hear a proud Serb saying, you know, I'm from Serbia and so on. They were always promoting this Yugoslav identity. Have you heard about this or is this new for you, Jeff? No, uh, um, no, it's always uh, this kind of ambiguity in all communist regimes. You have the the idealism or the ideology of uh, uh, humanity being as one, like the John Lennon song, but then you have the reality that things don't really work that way. The hypocrisy of the day-to-day, -day, uh, which is always the case in all communist regimes, uh, you, you find this the case. So it's not, yeah, I've, I've, you always, when people read about these regimes, they can get confused because they can actually believe that the ideology or the claims of the regime are true. But the claims, we, we mustn't be naive, that the claims of, of most regimes that, that have an ideology uh, it contain essential falsifications of reality. Yes. Now, if we, if, and, and what is interesting, if you look at now, usually like this old writer, he started this, that the, he, he started with this simplified, you know, conception that the West, they wanted to break Yugoslavia and so on. So they utilized this divide and conquer strategy to balkanize the country and to break it down into statelets. 
many states, that is. So Yugoslavia remains weak and, and so on. But the fact of the matter is when Yugoslavia, let's say when they have the first, let's say, free elections and so on, you had Franjo Tuzman gaining power, Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia, Alija Izabegovic in Bosnia, and, Slo and, and the Slovenian counterpart, I don't know exactly his name and so on. But it was very interesting when Slovenia proclaimed its independency. You know, we want to we want to leave Yugoslavia and so on. They had some kind of a scuffle. It started first the conflict there, and the Yugoslav forces went in, and you had a ten day crisis or something. I think it was a little bit of shooting, but nothing really happened. But then, when the war erupted between Croatia and Serbia, when all of a sudden you have a fault line conflict, you know, a really brutal ethnic warfare. And and in the beginning, like like the way we see it in like that Germany was the country who was the first among, let's say, the, let's say the powers in Europe and so on that recognized Croatia. And but the United States remained quite not that, you know, I mean, for, for the, from the US vantage point. They did not care that much if Yugoslavia was about to disintegrate because, I mean, like many people, they they do. They, they simply think that, oh, Yugoslavia, they did not want to integrate in this world economic system. They wanted to, you know, continue with their socialism and so on. But this is not actually true either, because the Serbs would have, you know, they would have agreed with a free market economy. The only thing that the Serbs wanted, they wanted to remain in power and to control these republics. So Washington, the very beginning, was not that keen on dividing Yugoslavia until when the war extended to Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was in 1992, that Beograd was on Washington's shit list due to the atrocities the Serbs committed. What would you say about that, Jeff? Well, yeah, of course, there's always this sensitivity when a country commits... Uh atrocities Americans are always recoil even when it's a country that they might previously have backed or favored um, it's uh, we, we we have this thing in, a, in America where we have this yeah. very moralistic view of of events overseas mm -hmm. so but, yeah, yeah, but, yeah it, but, but, but Jeff but, sorry we got a little bit disconnected here but well, the way the way we see it in, in the beginning was that Germany was in favor of a of a of a free of a sovereign Croatia, but but Washington was a little bit ambivalent. They they naturally negotiated with the Serbian counterparts and so on, but it was not in the beginning that they wanted the Yugoslavia to break down. But it was afterwards when the war was prolonged to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Yeah, and you saw all those all those it, uh, atrocities being committed. It, then it was suddenly a humanitarian concern. Please, what would you say? Yeah. yeah, well, well, it's very important for people. Many people in Europe have misunderstood the United States. You have, uh, for example, George H. W. Bush giving his Chicken Kiev speech right in Kiev, begging the the Ukrainians not to break away from the Soviet Union, which is a a, a very strange thing. You would say. Why would the United States not want the Soviet Union to break up or Yugoslavia to break up? It, it comes from the, the idea of, of what the United States wanted was stability. They didn't want the instability of, of now if Ukraine breaks away from the Soviet Union, you have two nuclear powers in Eastern Europe to contend with. Sure. And, and they might even end up uh, falling into fighting with each other in a nuclear war. And so the United States has imagines all these problems. So the United States, of course... Uh, didn't necessarily like the idea of Yugoslavia breaking up. And the, the idea of uh, the United States somehow or NATO being behind the breakup of Yugoslavia is quite absurd. And if we go to the defector literature, Jan Shana, who I mentioned before in his book, We Will Bury You, written in 1982, he has a chapter on Yugoslavia in which he says that what he heard in the Eastern Bloc was the plan was to infiltrate Yugoslavia along ethnic lines and to break it up along ethnic lines after Tito's death, to, to, make a, to prepare a civil war so that it was actually the plan of Moscow 
to mm -hmm. ethnically break up Yugoslavia, not the plan of NATO. And I exactly. think that's and important. I think it's a very crucial point here. I know it's a very good point. And I want to spin on this because if we look at here, like Tito in 1974, he made a new constitution, which was actually used, you know, as a, let's say, um, document to, to also to somehow discuss how the Serbs and Croats will, you know, establish their own states and so on. And in this document from 1974, he was very clear that he wanted all of the republics to have considerably aut autonomy. He realized in 1970, in 1974, prior to this, that it was very difficult to keep these people together, especially to quell Croat separatism. He, he knew that. So all, all of a sudden he was really let's say forecasting that the Yugoslavia will fall and what and afterwards in 1980 in the beginning of the 80s when Tito died you have their first turmoil in Kosovo you know the Albanian dominated southern part of Serbia and mm. there you have their first social upheavals you know and then it spread and then you had started the the war between Serb Serbia and Croatia now, what is very interesting, like I said in the beginning, that the Serbs, they had the possibility to accumulate those military forces, you know, because if you look at Yugoslavia at that point on, you know, it was it did not engage in foreign, you know, let's say wars and so on from 1945. It had a possibility to domestically, you know, build up its military capability. And at that time, Yugoslavia was the fourth largest military power in Europe, I would say. Some people claim even that it was much stronger than that. What would you say in terms of its military capability? Oh, it, it, for me, as a, as a person who studies military uh, history and military forces, it's astonishing the kind of military force that uh, had been built up in Yugoslavia that the Serbian government inherited. It's, uh, it's surprising. Uh, <laughs> Exactly, yeah. because if you look at the in terms of aviation and the reservists, they have over one million reservists. It's unbelievable at that point. Yeah, you know, yeah. And it, and, it and, has to do with the organization of the country, as you as you said before, uh, the way in which the the country was organized. And of course, you know, they they came out of a. If you think about it, Tito and his his group came out of a partisan movement, where that were mobilizing people to fight was part of their youth. And so it was never, and it's not that their military was technologically advanced. They were basically using Soviet weapons for the most part. They were, they were using Soviet built tanks and, and artillery and so on and, and aviation. But, um, and I think they had some Western weapons. Uh, yes, but they was, had Western was, weapons too. They bought Western, yeah. yes. Yeah, they had some Western weapons, but I think most of the tanks, most of the ordnance was, was from the Soviet bloc ordnance. Not that that was a bad thing, because the Soviets built some pretty good tanks. They had some pretty good tanks. And, of course, the infantry, what's important in a terrain like Yugoslavia is the infantry. Because exactly, the tanks. The tanks, the tanks the exactly. And, and the in FH, fact, by yeah. the way, um, in the terrain in Yugoslavia, the Soviet tanks, Soviet-built tanks, would be superior in that terrain to NATO tanks, because the advantage of NATO tanks was their guns could fire further. But in hilly country, range wouldn't matter because you'd never be engaging at range in a tank battle. You'd be engaging at very close range, in which case the Soviet tanks were, were better. They hit harder, and they had, they had, uh, they, if, the, if the crews were trained right, they could get the advantage over NATO tanks. So it, it's, it's just a little interesting thing. No, and it's a very important, it's a very good point. And, and I want to, let's say when, when, when the war started in 1991, you had it, it started first between Croats and Serbs. It started in Kraina, uh, in, 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 a, in a town, let's say called Knin. And you had, let's say the Serbian, they already started forming paramilitaries resembling a lot what the, what the separatists are doing in the Donbass region, you know, they're the Russian loyal. They wanted to break away. So they did not want to come, they did not want to negotiate in, in, a, in a discussion with Croats. They just chanted, oh, Croat, Ustasha, we don't want anything to do with you. So they started, you know, forming paramilitaries. And, and in, in the eastern part of, uh, of Croatia, you see a mobilization. And what happened? In 1991, in eastern part, in the town of Vukovar, 
the Serbian, the military contingency was totally pointing toward the Vukovars. So they, in, in three months, they, they emptied as much as they possibly could. Over one million bombs fell over Vukovar. However, what happened was that the Serbs, they encountered heavily resistance. And this actually crippled the Yugoslav army because they have colossal losses in the Vukovar. What would you say about the Battle of Vukovar, Jeff? Well, again, the, the size of, a, of an army might not be an advantage in that kind of terrain, because when, you, when, you have, when you're advancing over uh, hilly ground, uh, you have these situations of ambush where the defending in modern warfare, defensive fire is, uh, over, can be overpowering, where you have interlocking fields of fire. So if you advance in the wrong way or the advance is uncoordinated or a, the general makes a mistake, you can have the slaughter of the advancing troops in that situation. It's the kind of situation that uh, armies traditionally, generals traditionally get themselves into trouble when they're attacking. Sure. So when the terrain favors the defense to that extent, it's not the outcome is not all that surprising. And when you look at a communist regime uh, uh, coming out of this, uh, this situation of Tito having such a strong hand, you probably had a lot of generals who were not very good generals on the Serbian side. No, because many top top tier, let's say, officers and so on were killed in, in the Battle of Vukovar. And but you had the mobilization of let's say the Yugoslav army again in Vukovar. But you had also the Serbian paramilitary forces. You have the this Arkans Tigers, the the also it is another man by the name of Vojislav Šešel, who is a radical Serbian chauvinist. And he had also his uh, paramilitaries present there. So you had, a, the, let's say, a combination of various types of forces. And uh, surely, with the amount of pressure that they put on, they encountered heavily resistance. But after three months, Vukovar simply fell. And then you had the Serbian army went in and they committed an atrocity, killing several thousands of people. They went on a killing spree. So, and, and, but many military analysts say, if the Croats would not be able to put such strong resistance in Vukovar, the outcome would have been differently because maybe Serbs would have won that war. Actually, what would your opinion be on that? Well, in the in the long run, the side with the with the most troops is is probably going to win, despite losses, heavier losses, and despite setbacks. So without outside help, yeah, Croatia was probably not going to be able to maintain its independence in the long run without some kind of outside help. And, uh, and of course, you have the pressure created by, if you commit an atrocity, the, what does the West do? It sanctions you. It sanctions the government. It cuts you off from resources. It makes it difficult for you to economically operate. And and so sometimes that hurt the pain from that economic pain is so great just, that that you back off. Sure. I just want to make a point here that the Battle of Vukovar took place in 1991. The international community at that time, I would say, gave the Serbs, let's say, a tacit signal. Let's say, go in, you know, do what you want, but to do not, you know, to, to control the chaos that is. And actually, but it, uh, the way I see it, it was not until 1992 when the war extended to Bosnia and Herzegovina that actually the international community took it quite seriously because, you know, you had the siege of Sarajevo and so on. And then the international community, they were very, let's say, keen on saving Bosnians, let's say, saving this city, this multi-ethnic city multicultural city of Sarajevo was a symbol, you know, of the, you had Serbs, you had Croats, you had a Jewish population and so on, and you have also gypsies and so on living there. So Sarajevo was actually a symbol for the multi-ethnicity -ethni of a country. And all of a sudden, when Sarajevo was under siege and so on, well, then I fully understand that the international community, United Nations, and the United States and so on, they went and tried to penalize the Serb. But prior to that, the old writers, they, they got it a bit wrong. Like, for instance, a country that the old writers are going so much against is the country of Israel. 
and Israel was very was did not want to go against Yugoslavia. They did not even want the Yugoslavia to be bombed in 1999. They always had excellent ties with with the, with, with Serbs. What would you say about that? Well, yeah, that's um, that's quite true because of the the kind of positioning that Yugoslavia had had in the past. Sir, uh, Belgrade had 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 certain relationships, and people don't tend to change their relationships uh, that that often. Of course, when they and have and them. I'm uh, precise. I think it's a very good point, and I think also when when you saw. For instance, the Serbs, like I said in the beginning, due to the concentration camp of Yasenovac, they use this victimology to benefit themselves, especially when, when, when the Cold War ended and when the Soviet Union disintegrated in 1991 and you had free elections in Yugoslavia. The Serbs, they were, they were, they were saying, look, we were persecuted by the Croat Ustasha, you know, together with the Jewish people and so on. So they been, so they wanted to expand on this narrative much further together to, to receive some kind of recognition from the international community. Albeit what happened was that the Serbs, they were somehow, the war got out of their control. They were keen on revitalizing the greatest Serbian empire from, let's say, the, during the kingdom era. And, and it was their plan to do so, but this somehow failed with 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 the backlash and all of a sudden Belgrad became a thorn in Washington's eye, I would say. But it was not prior to this, yes. Well, it's interesting. Europe had developed this self-image with the European community. There hadn't been a major war in Europe since 1945. The idea of this war in Europe suddenly, where there were atrocities again, it was not only kind of horrifying, it was also in a way humiliating and went against the idea that Europe had changed, that Europe had learned, and that, you know, Yugoslavia, uh, you know, was part of this more enlightened Europe, and that obviously it wasn't, and that ethnic conflict could arise again was a kind of scandal for, for the, the European community, because the idea was we're we're getting rid of ethnic differences. How can there be a war over, you know, between ethnic groups in Europe again? You know, are we going back to 1945? So there's there's that psychological reaction to it as well, I think. Of course. And also you have the, for instance, like uh, the what happened was you saw a classic. I'm not going to go too much into this, but you like Thomas Hobbes would say a war against all. You had a clash of civilizations. You have, for instance, when the war extended to Bosnia, the, 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 uh, let's say the Turks, they were very, you know, sympathetic to the, to the Bosnian cause. And, and let's say some Western powers, let's say Western countries, uh, were very sympathetic to the Croatian cause. And actually you had Russians and many or Greeks and so on and other Orthodox countries also being, let's say, sympathetic to the, to the Serbian cause. So you have this fault line division between these groups belonging to different civilizations. So you had an ethnic war with a very strong magnitude manif materializing again on European soil, just like you said, Jeff, yes. And here's what's interesting, is that, that Moscow could see this as an opportunity. Why divide it? Because what Moscow's always looking for is a way to divide Europe. And what is it? You made an excellent point here. What is this uh, crisis in miniature in Yugoslavia? You've got Croatia, Western facing, Catholic. You've got Bosnia, supported by Turkey. You've got Serbia, with its Eastern, you know, Orthodox connections to Greece and and to, and to Russia. Uh, Russia, Belarus, and and and, 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 and so. Uh, you have now you have the perfect storm. You have the situation where you could actually create a division. You could get people to divide up. And Moscow is probably thinking, oh, wow, this is great. We could get the, you know, we could get the Turks to be mad at more mad at the Greeks and more mad at Brussels and more mad at, at Berlin or Paris or whatever. And so 
this is always they're always the Russians always think in this way, dividing exactly. No, oh, yeah. of course, and they wanted to also have an opportunity to 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 position themselves within the Balkan region. But what happened was at that time, like I said, that the atrocity atrocities went out of hand. The Serbs started installing these concentration camps and so on. We're, we Croats did too in in Bosnia, not in Croatia, but. Because the Croats also, we somehow we ended up in a conflict with the Bosnian Muslims too in the beginning, and then with the date uh, with the Dayton Agreement and so on, all of a sudden, U.S. President Clinton he wanted a coalition between between Bosnians and Croats to go against the Serbs and so on, and I think the United States they wanted to stop the Russian influence in the region. And I believe that that's the reason why they bombed uh, those installations in in uh, in the Bosnian Serbian Republic called Republika Srpska, like they bombed in 1995. They started the bombing campaign at that time. Yes. Um, now let's talk about Milosevic. Um, how do you how do you see his rise, and what he did? How do you see him as a politician? I see Milosevic as a pragmatic, power-enhancing individual looking to maximize his interests. I see him as, uh, let's say, a socialist. Uh, I don't see him as a chauvinist or a nationalist, even though he utilized this discourse to gain popularity. He even had a radical Serb by the name of Vojislav Šešeli, who has this party... Uh, Let's say it's Serbska Radical Nastraka, the Serbian Radical Party. So it's basically a Chetnik party, and this idiot has proclaimed himself as a Chetnik leader and so on. He's totally appalling, this individual. He's an anti Croat. I don't like him. But anyway, so he even gave him a position in his ca cabinet to, to rule the country. So he utilized all sides in order to stay in power, and I view him as, a, as a sim simply a pragmatist socialist. What would you, how would your description be on him? Well, you know, the very interesting thing about Milosevic is the way the Chinese viewed him. The Chinese communists viewed him as a Marxist-Leninist paragon. And that is, is really interesting to me. So that the West, in the West, they view him as a, as a Serbian nationalist, uh, almost as a fascist, you know. But in... China, the, the great, the big communist power at the moment, he was seen as a fellow communist. And so there's obviously, with so many of the politicians of this kind, there's this red-brown uh, aspect where they use the nationalist right and they are, they are communist. Uh -huh. And they somehow try to meld them together. It's something we've seen in China with the introduction under Xi Jinping of the great Han uh, uh, chauvinism. We see it with Putin in, in, um, in the new Russia uh, and the annexation of Crimea. We, we see, and uh, Yugoslavia is maybe one of the first, Milosevic is sort of one of the first examples of this in the post-Cold War era of the trying to combine the nationalist right with the, the Bolshevik left in a way that, you know, maybe it's, it's almost like the, the famous uh, saying about an American politician, he has one speech to give to this group, and he's got a different speech he gives to the other group. So that well, that he's, could he's be, got yeah, two that faces. could be, that, yeah, yeah, that could be, that could be. He was a very, he was a pragmatist and so on. I think he, 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 he did. Um, he was not a brilliant, let's say, military strategist and so on. I think he, he messed up real when he put all everything on the line to squash Vukovar and so on, because that led to a backlash. Like I said, the, the Croat resistance, I'm very proud of uh, the resistance that the Croat people did. Uh, I was a child at that, uh, when this happened and so on, but I'd heard many stories and so on. It was unbelievable how they were subjected to, to these intense bombings from, from the Serbian forces. And still, the Yugoslav forces had so many casualties at that on, and I think that this actually broke the back of Yugoslavia. Uh, and then the war naturally it was extended, and it draw in external powers and so on. And then it was 
a dead end for Yugoslavia, I would say. So, but basically, we have summarized it a little bit. You know, I think it's a very complicated case because we went back from the Ottoman rule to the breakup of modern Yugoslavia. And I think I, I, if, if, if the, anyone who, who is tuning in wants me to do a video, I know there's some followers that I do have that are Croatian that said would appreciate it. But if others are interested too, I will make a video on this so we can discuss in depth certain aspects of it. But I think, I mean, I'm very fine. I think we hit almost every point from this on. Is there anything more you would like to add to this, Jeff, or are you fine? Well, I might add with the Kosovo War at the tail end. Oh, that was which, in 1999, yes. Which, which, which began the revival. This is 1999 was the year that Putin was made prime minister, that Russia switched back to moving back in a Soviet direction uh, overtly, and they used the Kosovo War and the negative reaction to the bombing of Serbia by NATO, which was against the NATO charter, by the way. They used it to rally. The, the Russian people were 70% pro-American before the bombing of Serbia, and they flipped to being 70% anti-American after the bombing. And... I think that it was that was a very key turning point moment for for Russia and the revival of the the open revival of a kind of Cold War moving back towards uh, what the what the communist uh, underground in Russia wanted. And I think the 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 other important aspect was from the American point of view, the way we view it is that this is when Clinton was beset by scandals, particularly the China Gate scandal in which uh, his the Secretary of Commerce, Ron Brown, uh, died in a su suspicious plane crash at Dubrovnik, mm -hmm. in which uh, Kathleen Janowski found a 45 caliber bullet hole in, uh, in uh, Ron Brown's head during the autopsy uh, after the crash. And uh, there were x-rays made of that, saying, wait a minute, was this crash, was this guy assassinated? What happened here at this crash? Which of course happened in 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 this part of the world, ironically, and that yes. uh, and that uh, beset by these scandals and by the Monica Lewinsky scandal, you suddenly had this diversion where uh, uh, Clinton gets to act presidential. He gets to send our forces into uh, an air war, in a bombing war, and uh, sure. many people here viewed it as a sort of Clinton getting out of trouble by by, I by having this conflict. Although I don't think that's necessarily mm. what I think that the Germans wanted to go in, other NATO countries wanted to intervene. So it's a pretty complicated story. But I just thought I'd mention that. No, I think I think it's an excellent topic so we can discuss because like uh, like you said, w why didn't they bomb in 1991? Why did they wait until 1999 to bomb Serbia and so on? So yes. But also I want to make another quick note, like, yes, it is correct, like you said, the Kosovo War was used, let's say, to, to, to build up this anti-Americanism, obviously. But also what is very important, you had also the Second Chechen War uh, that was pushed forward by, by Vladimir Putin when he came to power. So, yes. And uh, so we saw a much more aggressive Russia at that point on. Uh, a revival, you might say, perfectly well summarized to, to let's say, some kind of a neo-Bolshevism. Absolutely, I agree with that. But this is like, there are many subjects that we touched upon, and I think it's a little bit complicated. So I think we will leave it from here, and then we will pick, on, pick up on this at the, at the next, let's say, for instance, discussion. Uh, but uh, I want to thank everyone for tuning in here. I see more subscribers joining the channel. I'm very grateful to this. If you like this, make sure to hit that like button and please make sure to subscribe. And please also, as always, leave me a comment, let you know what you think about the video. How did I and Jeff argue and so on? Did you like it? Was it of any value and so on? I'm always keen on hearing what my audience have to say. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for joining me and let's do this again, okay? Very good. Right.